There are many that feel that Constantine's conversion to Christianity was sincere, and that converting to a minority sect made up of supposed communities of the lower classes had no political or power advantage. However, in this presentation, I will show that the current understanding and the preconceptions that come along with that understanding appear to be wrong. It all starts with accounts that describe Constantine's vision, as that is where we get our information from. According to Eusebius, in Life of Constantine, in which the man who is known to us as Eusebius writes a favourable biography of the emperor, Constantine sees something in the sky. We read that in 312 CE, at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, which was essentially a battle between Emperor Constantine and Maxentius over the throne of Rome, Constantine looked up to the sun before the battle and saw a cross of light above it, and with it the Greek words Theodotonica, meaning in this sign conquer which is often rendered into the Latin version, Enoch Signor Vinces, which means, in this sign you will conquer. Constantine then commanded his troops to adorn their shields with a Christian symbol, the Cairo symbol, which are the first two letters of the Greek word for Christos. Eusebius says that Constantine did not know which god gave him the sign in the sky, but that he was so moved by his vision of the cross that he vowed to worship no other god than the one represented to him. He then began to seek out those who might help him to learn more about what he had seen. We are told the priests of God became his close advisers, and he believed that it was his duty to honour the god who had appeared to him in his original vision. We are told that bishops regularly travelled with Constantine. From what we read, we are given to understand that these bishops made Constantine confidently believe that Jesus was the only begotten Son of God, and that the cross he had seen in his vision was a symbol of Jesus' triumph over death. That means that these accounts contain discrepancies. So, obviously, one of these accounts is wrong or confused, which makes neither one reliable. But the important factor that comes from this information and time in history is the fact that it starts the long process of making Christianity the official religion of Rome, which it would eventually become in 380 CE under Theodosius I. Further, Libanius, who we are told was a Greek teacher of rhetoric of the Sophist school, and during the rise of Christian dominance in the time of Constantine remained a Hellenistic pagan, contradicts himself regarding Constantine's vision and adoption of Christianity. On one hand, he states Constantine's army fought against the gods as early as 312 CE, referring to the supposed Christian tradition regarding Constantine's victory over Maxentius under the cross. On the other hand, Constantine's own adoption of Christianity is assigned to after the overthrow of Licinius, as opposed to when Constantine defeated Maxentius. Libanius was clearly trying to link Constantine's adoption with the looting of pagan temples, which began after the final defeat of Licinius. Licinius and Constantine co-authored the Edict of Milan, granting official toleration to Christians in the Roman Empire. However, pagan tradition claims Constantine's adoption was due to guilt from the execution of Flavia Maxima Forster, his second wife, and Crispus, his eldest son. Apparently, when pagan priests refused to purify him, he turned to an Egyptian from Spain, who promised him Jesus would forgive him. 
There is a problem that has always been present when researching this period of history, and in particular, Christianity's history. It is no secret that every source of information for this religion's history comes from one direction, Rome. It is believed that Christianity was a fast-growing religion at the time, but it was not. It is known that the Sadducean Jewish sect, who received their support from the aristocracy and therefore supported the monarchy, had resorted to church prostitution to make money. The leaders of the early Christian church, which based on a thoroughly critical examination of primary and secondary sources, appears to be members of the Calpurnius Pisa family, had built many tiny rooms into the sides of the church where patrons could pay for sex. The New Testament contains sexually explicit passages, as evidenced by the Oxford Encyclopedia Biblica. The encyclopedia gave the original meanings of words used in the biblical texts, some of which offended many. The passages could be read to make the people in the churches sexually aroused, because most of the people who were not of the aristocracy did not read, which is supported by the research conducted by Catherine Hetzer, they had no idea whether or not those lines were actually in the texts that were being read to them in the early churches. The Oxford Encyclopedia Biblica states, The offer of the body, which was in honour of the deity, and prevailed in the northern Semitic religions, where a special class of temple harlots was maintained, and commerce with them was a religious act. Essentially, the new Christian churches were simply brothels, just like the high places of the Old Testament, where all prostitutes had their fees. This is shown in the story of Tamar and Judah, where she, acting as the professional prostitute, says, What wilt thou give me, that thou mayest come in unto me? There were little rooms of around eight feet by five feet surrounding the temple, which were chambers for men and women for the purpose of being joined. Emperor Titus, is reported to have left valuable gifts for the benefit of the maidens whose converse he had enjoyed, and for the temple treasury when he visited Paphos on his way to subjugate Jerusalem. Even the locations the man who is known to us as Paul travels to were known for having great Roman brothels. Essentially, the mentioning of these locations acted as advertisements for these churches or brothels. Traditional Jewish sources condemn prostitution and trafficking, although there are some mixed messages. In Deuteronomy, we read, Do not degrade your daughter, and make her a harlot lest the land fall into holotry and the land be filled with depravity. Although the law appears to allow male soldiers to rape foreign captive women. The Talmud too gives mixed messages, which can be viewed as more preventative cautions than permissions. A text about prostitution and Jewish men frequenting prostitutes states that it is Better that a man secretly transgress and not publicly profane God's name, so that no one learns from his actions, and that if a man sees that his evil inclination overwhelms him, he should go to a place where he is unknown, wear black clothing, and cover himself with black, perhaps to subdue his lust, and do what his heart desires, so that he does not publicly profane God's name. With the Christian churches, or brothels, blatantly offering prostitution, the wives of the locations became aware, leading to an uproar. The people in those cities drove the operators of the early churches out of their towns and cities, 
Therefore, the only way to make the new Christian religion or law appear to be growing was by the use of scripture, essentially creating the perception that it was growing. The use of the Christian scriptures by Constantine was a great tactical move to unite the disparate pagan tribes in the Roman Empire under just one belief system, leading to more unity right across the empire. The sources from around Constantine's time paint highly positive, biased arguments for highly complex Christian theology, and describes converts apparently rapidly accepting these ideas and, in so doing, changing their lives for this religious movement. Even after his supposed vision, and then conversion, Constantine still retained many pagan attributes, and until 321 CE, his coins were still inscribed with the symbols of traditional Roman gods, Mars, Jupiter, Apollo, and particularly the sun god Sol Invictus. In his city of Constantinople, a statue depicted him wearing the radiant crown of Sol. He also still allowed pagan temples to be built. Now one possible reason for this is because although he had converted, the act of forcing others to convert at that time was an unknown practice. However, he did grant toleration to all religions in 313 CE, with the Edict of Milan, but this only benefited Christianity. Many coins were issued by Constantine with pagan images and motives. After the year 305 CE is when Emperor Constantine seems to have first adopted Sol Invictus as his personal deity and protector. However, the gods, Mars, Hercules, and Jupiter, still appear on his coinage. It was not unusual for an emperor to identify himself with a particular god, and Constantine seems to have initially adopted the sun god, Sol Invictus, around 309 to 310 CE. Then, later, it seems he used this association as a link to his supposed conversion, going from the Sun God to the Son of God. Christianity incorporated a variety of beliefs, with no reason to insist that only one was correct. Constantine changed that understanding to insist that only one doctrine could be tolerated. Many problems arose from this change, one of which concerned the theology around the Trinity and the nature of free will and original sin. The monotheism of Judea prevented the worship of Rome's declared gods from being adopted or even tolerated by the cult of Yahweh. This was seen as a serious problem in Rome. The solution, therefore, was to undermine the Jewish faith by playing on their hopes for a messiah while slowly introducing the concept of a plural God, the Holy Trinity. The beginning of Mark contains a mysterious character called Spiritus Sanctus, or Spiritus Sancto, the earliest versions of which have Spiritus Sanctus mentioned in the first chapter. And, as far as my investigations go, I can find no precedent for this term. If this is the earliest instance of Spiritus Sanctus, then logically conjecturing that the primary aim was to subtly undermine the Jewish monotheistic belief system, using a vague term like this, is not unreasonable. Spiritus Sanctus can be interpreted in more than one way. Dedicated breath is an equally valid translation, though Holy Spirit is the meaning that became canon. The word spirit, interestingly, can be viewed as the word pneuma, the ancient Greek word for breath. In the Greek translations of the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, the word pneuma is used for spirit or soul. 
An important point to make here is that the word Numa is the name of Numa Pompilius, one of the main ancestors of the Capernius Piso family. The sponsorship of pagan cults by the elite declined, leading to a sharp decline of pagan temples. This happened over the course of three to four generations, beginning from the conversion of Emperor Constantine. It is during this period that the common people began converting to this new religion, although the numbers given by supposed Christian commentators of the time are undoubtedly inflated. Regarding the supposed widespread destruction of pagan temples at this time, archaeological evidence points to that as not being the case. In a publication called The Archaeology of Late Antique Paganism, it states, As a result of recent work, it can be stated with confidence that temples were neither widely converted into churches nor widely demolished in late antiquity. According to Bayliss's study, only around 120 temples are known to have been converted into churches. Evidence of desacralization or active architectural destruction of temples from any source is still very rare in terms of the thousands of temples known around the Roman Empire. In his empire-wide study, Bayliss located only 43 cases of desacralization or active architectural destruction of temples of which a mere four were archaeologically confirmed. Only the provinces in the Levant, the eastern Mediterranean region of Western Asia, in Levant's words, seem to have been a hotspot for temple destruction. 21 of 43 cases of temple destruction or desecration cited by Bayliss come from this zone. It is clear that the success of Christianity as we know it today is mainly due to Constantine's long reign, and that his family and all emperors after, apart from Julian, or rather Flavius Claudius Julianus, whose short reign had no real impact, portrayed themselves as Christians. But, as the genealogies on my site show, a link of which will be provided in the video's description below, Constantine's family could only have been Christians in a political sense, not the believer sense. The motivation for Constantine converting to Christianity was clearly not a divine one, because, for one thing, there is no evidence for it being a divine one. Well, there is evidence, but that evidence is incredibly unreliable. Constantine's conversion was a purely political decision, and his divine vision was created as a convincer story to give a dramatic reason for his conversion, a story which could neither be debunked nor verified, which seems to be the norm with many vision stories regarding religion. He realised that a Christian belief was the route to success, which is evident in the fact that he gave official orders which began the feudal system, or in other words, a slave system. The word serf, used for an agricultural labourer, who is bound by the feudal system, is just a synonym for slave, and when research is carried out in regards to the hierarchy structure of this system, we find the Pope, Emperor, at the top, then below that you have the Cardinals, and religious and military individuals, but as you get to the bottom, you see the serf, or labourer, slave who is literally an animal, sometimes even a sheep. The official orders given by Constantine, which began the transition of Christianity being made into the state religion, are presented as being separate from the orders that created the feudal system. But they are not separate at all. They are part of the same process. In reality, Constantine effectively created a feudal system that replaced an existing freer system, in the 1st and 2nd centuries, big landowners found it more profitable to lease out their property to small farmers, who paid rent. Therefore, tenant farmers flourished. 
Small farmers were free to give up their farms at the end of their tenancies, normally after five years. Though most stayed, the option to move was there. In the third century, however, the increasing taxes as a result of new terms of trade and the rising number of bureaucrats made these small farmers worse off. Many became unprofitable. The tenants gave up the farms and relocated to the cities, leaving many farms abandoned. Previously, the running of the empire had been what we could call amateurish, a minimum of bureaucracy, few controls and low taxes, and it worked. Emperor Diocletian changed this by implementing similar feudal restrictions to Constantine, by mandating that sons take the professions of their fathers, high taxes, and demanding commodities and finished goods. Few Romans protested as they were led to believe they were gaining more security by giving up their freedom, but it was not worth it. We see this as being true when researching a whole class of citizens called the colony, who developed ownership rights by essentially cultivating the wild land. They would colonise the land, which is where the expression colonisation comes from, and they would then turn the wild land into farming land, and they could own the product produced from that land. Emperor Constantine changed this and began to issue official orders which stated that you could not own the land or the product of that land, and if the magistrate decided they needed more population in some other area, then your children could be sold. As far as occupations were concerned, it had to be the same occupation as your father, and you could not change occupations or ever leave the land. So what we have here is the beginning of what would become the medieval feudal system, and the Roman Catholic Church is an element of that feudal system. By taking a step back, we can see how it functioned. The serf, or labourer or slave, was given a religious context for slavery. They were told that the representative of Jesus Christ was basically telling him to accept his hardship. They were told that there was going to be a worker's paradise for the individual once he dies. But in the meantime, just do what the magistrate tells you to do and everything will be fine. The teaching of the church was that God appointed the Pope and kings, that is, the divine right of kings, meaning each person was led to believe that their determined position in society was divinely chosen. The pagan beliefs of Rome were a matter of life and death. They were true religions to the common people. The Roman Empire welcomed new religions when new countries became part of the empire. Mithras from the East, Sibylle from Asia Minor, and Isis from Egypt, to name a few. Emperor Constantine's ancestors, the Flavians and Capernus Pisas, were responsible for the creation of the early Christian scriptures, as is detailed in my book, Creating Christianity, A Weapon of Ancient Rome in which I present evidence from primary and secondary sources showing the parallels between the New Testament and the works of the man known as Flavius Josephus and the identity of the man who used the name Flavius Josephus. Emperor Constantine's descent from the Calpurnius Pisa family can be viewed in the article Constantine and Christianity, It Was Just Politics, on my website. In regards to the Flavian family, Emperor Constantine's family is referred to by scholars as the New Flavians or New Flavians. This is not due to the fact that those scholars have traced back Constantine's descent from the Flavian dynasty of the first century but because members of Constantine's family used the name Flavius, as if a rebirth of the early Flavian dynasty. Scholars have thought that this was done in an attempt to show themselves triumphant in the ways that the early Flavian dynasty had been, and not because they were actually descended from the Flavian family. But Emperor Constantine's family had used the name Flavius because they knew of their descent from those earlier Flavians, 
but the general public was kept in the dark about this. Emperor Constantine's descent from the Flavian family comes through Emperor Vespasian's son, Emperor Titus, through his daughter, Julia Flavia Titia, from her marriage to T. Flavius Sabinus IV, son of T. Flavius Sabinus III. In the historical record, Julia's and Flavius Sabinus IV's son is oddly recorded as Lucius Vivius Sabinus, who died in 97 CE. There were four individuals within a succession that carried the name T. Flavius Sabinus in the Flavian family, those being Emperor Vespasian's father, brother and nephew, among others, causing confusion for some researchers. The name Flavius Sabinus looks to have stopped being used in that form after Flavius Sabinus IV. However, the name Vibius, or Vivius, looks to be a disguised form of his family name Flavius, using similar literary techniques as Vespasian used, as presented in the video The Royal Ancestry of Emperor Vespasian. The Flavians were of royal Jewish descent, that of Herod the Great, and looked to have used the Hebrew alphabet and spellings to create variations of the family name. V becomes F phonetically, I and L in ancient languages look the same, and B and V were interchangeable. Vowels could also be dropped exchanged and viewed as not being there at all. So with the above data and evidence, we see the name Flavius. From Lucius Flavius Sabinus, Emperor Constantine's descent from the Flavian family continues down through Emperor Septimius Severus and eventually arrives at an individual recorded in history as Eutropius, who is recorded as the father of Emperor Julius Constantius Chlorus, the father of Emperor Constantine. The name Eutropius is recorded in the Historia Augusta, a late Roman collection of biographies of the Roman emperors which looks to have been compiled by Julius Constantius I, who was the younger half-brother of Emperor Constantine the Great. The Historia Augusta is believed by scholars to be an unreliable source. However, because the data and evidence shows that various literary techniques were used to create names and give information, the Historia Augusta presents much more information than many realise. Regarding Emperor Constantius Chlorus's father, recorded as Eutropius, in the Historia Augusta, the life of Claudius, we read, since we have now described his achievements in war, we must tell a few things, at least concerning the kindred and the family of Claudius, lest we seem to omit what all should know. Now Claudius, Quintilus and Crispus were brothers, and Crispus had a daughter, Claudia. Of her and Eutropius, the noblest man of the Dardanian folk, was born Constantius Caesar. Describing Eutropius as the noblest man of the Dardanian folk is very important. Because the name Eutropius was considered fictitious by the late Sir Ronald Syme, who was recognised as an outstanding Roman historian of his generation, Eutropius being described as the noblest man of Dardanian folk allows us to unravel the true identity of this individual. 
the use of the phrase Dardanian folk points to the origin of this individual as being in Anatolia, modern-day Turkey. When researching information about Anatolia, we find that a family known as the Gordians originated from this area, those being Gordian I, Roman Emperor for 21 days with his son Gordian II in 238 CE. Gordian I also had a daughter named Antonia Gordiana, who became the mother of the future Roman Emperor Gordian III. The Historia Augusta records Antonia's name as Macia Faustina. Modern historians dismiss this name as being false. However, Archaeological discoveries have unearthed an inscription that gives support to the Historia Augusta regarding the father of Gordian I. In the Historia Augusta, Gordian I is stated as being the son of Macius Morales and Opia Gordiana, and, as mentioned, the Historia Augusta names the daughter as Macia Faustina. The found inscription reads, By vote of the city council, his native city set up this statue to Lucius Macius Faustinus Strategos, member of the Pan Hellenion, and a good orator, in honour of his upright character. The presentation of the inscription, as found in Corinth, Volume 8, Number 3, the inscriptions, 1926 to 1950, published by the American School of Classical Studies at Athens, states, In line 1, the stone is preserved in such a way as to show that the praenomen was either Aulus or Lucius. Also, nothing is known of Macius Faustinus, except that which can be learned from the present text. His career is to be dated in the reign of Antoninus Pius, for the letter forms point to a date for the inscription shortly after the middle of the second century. Through genealogical research, the knowledge of literary techniques used by the ancient royals, and through deduction, we can connect the name Eutropius to a man called Tiberius Claudius Martianus, who is associated with Antioch, Anatolia. The finding of a white marble statue base that honours a T. Opius Aelianus Aslepiodotus presents the inscription The homeland, with good fortune, set up the statue of Titus Oplius Elenius Aslepiodotus, the most splendid consular, governor of Caria and Phrygia, proconsul and corrector of Asia, founder and saviour also of his homeland, Tiberius Claudius Martianus, the first Archon, ruler, set this up. The name Eutropius can also be seen phonetically as Eutropius with a U, which links genealogically this name with the Gordian family, and through deduction the data leads us to Antonia Gordiana, daughter of Gordian I and mother of Gordian III, as being the mother of Eutropius, who married a man named Olpion of Lebanon, Western Asia, who was considered one of the great legal authorities of his time and was a member of the council of Septimius Severus. Ulpian's full Latin name was Gaius Domitius Annius Ulpianus, and Ulpianus can be Ulpius. Further, in the Historia Augusta, Antonia Gordiana is stated as being married to a Junius Bulbus. The name Junius Bulbus 
can be linked to the Piso family through Julius Piso, known in history as Julius Severus or Julius Servianus. Junius Bulbus's father-in-law is given as Annius Severus in the Historia Augusta, and the name Annius is a name used by members of the Piso family. Another clue to be found within the name Eutropius is the word tro, which can be linked to the word Troas, or Troy, also known as Ilium. The location of Troy is in Anatolia, modern-day Turkey. Numismatic evidence can be seen on the coinage of Emperor Gordian III, as shown here. Because the found inscription regarding the parentage of Gordian I, i.e. Macius Morellus and Opia Gordiana, adds support to what is presented within the Historia Augusta, we can be confident that the Historia Augusta does contain factual information, although mixed with fictitious details. For example, we read in the Historia Augusta regarding the family of the Gordians, of the three, Gordian the Elder, that is the first, was the son of Macius Morellus and Opia Gordiana. On his father's side, he traced his descent from the house of the Gracchi, on his mother's from the Emperor Trajan. Opia Gordiana was the sister of Emperor Marcus Aurelius. Emperor Marcus Aurelius was the grandson of the man known in history as M. Annius Verus II, which is another name for Justus Copernius Piso, a son of Arius Copernius Piso. Justus Copernius Piso, as M. Annius Verus II, married a daughter of a noble lady called Matidia I. That daughter was named Rupilia Faustina, aka Rupilia Liba, Liva, Livia, Frugi Pisa Piso. Also regarding Gordian the Elder, or Gordian the First, in the Historia Augusta it states, He himself as consul was most rich and powerful. At Rome he owned the house of Pompey. After the death of Pompey, the house became the property of Marcus Antonius or Mark Antony. Further, Gordian I's full name, as given in the historical record, was Marcus Antonius Gordianus Sempronianus Romanus Africanus. Essentially then, what the data presents is that Emperor Constantine the Great was not only related to the Flavian emperors and the Capernius Piso family, but was also related to the Gordian emperors and Emperor Trajan. Just like his ancestors, to Constantine, Christianity was simply a way to control how the slaves fought, so they would think they were doing the work of their god, as opposed to following the commands of the emperor. In part two, I will explain why Christianity only existed on paper before Constantine brought it back from the dead. I will also explain the actual reason for the scriptures being translated from Greek into Latin, despite the fact that during antiquity, Greek was by far the most widely spoken lingua franca in the Mediterranean world eventually becoming the official language of the Byzantine Empire and developed into medieval Greek. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in part two.